University of California Cooperative Extension and University of California Davis Veterinary Medicine is bringing to you a recording from their March 2022 webinar series. This series was co-hosted by University of California Cooperative Extension Advisors, Tracy Shore, Grace Woodmancy, Rebecca Ozerian, and Specialist, Dr. Gabby Meyer. Additional resources from this webinar and other cattle health videos can be found at ucanr.edu slash sites slash rangelands slash cattle health. This session is focused on herd bull health, diseases, and injuries, featuring Dr. Breck McNabb with the University of California Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. McNabb is a professor, director of the Large Animal Clinic at UC Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital, and a practicing veterinarian working with commercial cattle producers in the Sacramento region. We're going to get a chance to focus on um, some bull health, some bull general diseases, uh, and some injuries that can occur uh, beyond just normal, um, you know, lameness issues or traumatic injuries, but look to some potential reproductive injuries that you may have seen, may not have seen, but something that we can certainly pick up and hopefully diagnose and treat earlier to get these bulls back into um, a breeding program. And so as we go through, you know, we're going to talk about some general health issues and a lot of reproductive health issues, and that's the point of having bulls in the herd, right? But they're by no means mutually exclusive items. And so there's a lot of overlap between general health concepts and reproductive health concepts, as you'll see. Many times, reproductive health may suffer along with general health. And if you think about it from um, a biology view, you know, reproduction is often the first thing to shut down in an animal because it's not required for life, right? It's not required for that animal's maintenance day-to-day -day activities. It's an extra additive thing that takes a lot of energy to, for cows to cycle, for bulls to produce sperm, for bulls to seek out cows and heat and breed them. Um, and so if they're having severe disease uh, for whatever the disease is, severe energy deficiencies or mineral deficiencies, then reproduction is often the first thing to go. And we're gonna see that manifest in our overall herd health. So we're talking about this because a lot of us wanna see bull longevity in a beef herd, right? We wanna, we're making an investment either in home raised bulls or purchased bulls. And so the question always comes up, well, what does longevity really mean anyway? And I'm sure everyone here this evening would have a different answer uh, based on their own experiences and their own production goals. But when we think about longevity, um, in my mind, it's really the ability of a bull to remain healthy and pr productive as a member of the herd for as long as possible or as long as we choose. So longevity really allows us to change our bull battery or call a bull from the herd on our terms and not his. Um, and that really strengthens our ability to improve genetic change in the herd or change our production goals as we go through. If we're having, if we're not having longevity and we're having injuries or diseases that are leading to illness or death or premature culling, then it takes that control that we have out of, out of the equation. Um, so this is going to be a factor of bull selection initially, depending on which genetic traits you're looking to improve or maintain in your herd. Um, of course, general health maintenance, routine assessment of reproductive soundness, as we'll discuss this evening, um, and having realistic expectations for performance. You know, what are we actually asking these bulls to do? And are we giving them the opportunity, if you will, to do it in each herd? So the question often comes up, um, well, what's better, natural breeding with bulls or, or artificial insemination? And uh, it's really not that easy of an answer to give because there are so many variables and so many factors that go into this. Um, and you will, you'd find it online. There are many publications from many um, institutions putting together different partial budgets, looking at the profitability of artificial insemination in a beef herd versus the profitability of natural breeding with bulls. And then of course, there's everything in between where we have folks that will artificially inseminate their heifers with cleanup bulls and everything else um, with the mature cow herd. And so if we're gonna consider what makes um, 
an artificial insemination program, more economical or a natural breeding things, we have cow and bull sides of the equation to, to factor in. So things to think about on your cow or heifer side, of course, would be the number of cows and heifers you have, because obviously that's going to drive how many bulls you should have every season. But also what either your expected pregnancy rate will be or your historical pregnancy rates have been, because that's going to be a factor of the efficiency of breeding. Of course, when it comes to profitability, we need to think about um, how many calves will hit the ground, how many calves will wean, and at what age and weight they'll wean at, um, then the average expected value for each of those calves. On the bull side, of course, we have to figure, well, how many bulls are going to be required to achieve our natural service? And as a general rule of thumb for mature breeding herds, we're going to expect one bull to service 25 to 30 cows over the course of a breeding season. Younger bulls, we might only expect them to service one to 15, maybe one to 20 at the most if they're yearlings. Um, so they're not gonna be quite up to mature expectations just yet. Of course, the average price of a bull if we're gonna be purchasing new bulls. And then if we wanna think about the bull um, as, um, as an asset or like a piece of equipment, we should think about depreciating the value of that bull over the course of his life on the ranch because that's gonna factor into what we're going to replace him with in the future. Of course, the useful life of a bull, and you'll find various expectations and recommendations here, but in general, we'll see the average beef bull be three to four years um, of usefulness before he's either, um, uh, before his genetics either are not what we want to have in the herd anymore, or before he's so closely related to all the females in the herd that we want to avoid that inbreeding. So we're looking to outsource genetics by bringing in new bulls. And then there's the annual bull maintenance expenses, right? So feed, mineral supplements, protein supplements, any kind of medical or veterinary expenses, they're going to be required to keep the bull in prime condition, even though in a, you know, a single calving season herd, we're only using him for two to three months of the year. So generally speaking, and this is a big generalization, um, natural service tends to be more economical than artificial insemination in across all sizes of beef operations about two thirds of the time. The other third of the time or so, depending on the assumptions you're making and the size of the operation, artificial insemination may be more advantageous even though we have more input costs for purchasing semen, hormone use and labor to synchronize and breed heifers and cows. It really does depend on the size that we're going. But in general, natural breeding is still going to be um, more economical. Um, artificial and changes, you know, artificial insemination, of course, is useful if we're going to try and target changes in the genetic base. Maybe we'll use them to you know, breed heifers to bring in new genetics and then use a, um, an existing herd bull for cleanup. Um, certainly, it can affect profitability by speeding up the breeding and calving season. Uh, I have a couple of graphs coming up in a minute, but if you think about having you know, the majority of your calf crop uh, in the beginning of your calving season, that translates back to having the majority of your cows and heifers bred at the beginning of the breeding season. That gives us more time to wean a heavier calf and can bring on average a higher price per calf. So depending on how we look at our assumptions, we may skew it in, you know, towards natural breeding or artificial insemination. Um, and like I said, across all herd sizes, we tend to be more economical um, for natural breeding. And this is what we see, right? I mean, the um, USDA conducted their NOMS survey of beef cattle in 2017. So that's the National Animal Health Monitoring System. And about every 10 years, they survey um, various uh, commodities and animal production groups. And so 2017 was the beef year. So some of you might have been asked to provide data to um, aggregate on a national level to uh, normal beef practices, management factors, um, and market, uh, marketing availability. And so this fits, if we look at the top line, you know, about 90% of operations only use bull exposure for both cows and, and heifers. Um, it's a much smaller subset use artificial insemination only, and about 6.8% used a combination of artificial insemination following up with bull coverage. So this supports sort of the, um, uh, the justifications that we've been talking about. 
So certainly we're going to be putting a lot of investment in our bulls. And because they're a small proportion of the overall herd, we really want to make sure that we can maintain both general health and reproductive health. So this is looking at the percent of operations that do some kind of bull exam, whether it's a semen test, um, simply a scrotal measurement or a scrotal palpation, um, and then looking at testing for TRIC. Um, and so the, um, the darker bar on the far right of each group is the aggregate, so the sum of all operations. And then it's broken down, as you can see, by size of operation, because it's very interesting that we often see a difference in smaller versus larger operation for a lot of management factors. So overall, again, roughly two thirds of all um, operations reported that um, they do some kind of semen test uh, and just shy of that for a scrotal measurement. And you can see larger operations tend to rely on those types of factors more so than a smaller operation. And so I'd like to talk for a few minutes about the justification and the importance of doing a veterinary bull breeding status exam because it can really help us not only on bull selection when we're purchasing bulls, <coughs> excuse me, um, but also on an annual basis to make sure that they're ready for the breeding season and can serve us the number of cows or heifers that we expect them to. And so really basically the whole purpose of a breeding standards exam on a bull is, um, and I like this quote, to see if the bull is able to produce adequate numbers of normal sperm and possess the ability and desire to deposit those sperm into a cow. Uh, so if that doesn't sum up a, uh, um, a BSC, I'm not sure what does. Um, and so what this is, you know, it's not a test that's gonna try to identify the best of the best. What it's designed as is really a screening test and looking to find the bulls that do not meet the minimum standards we have set um, for breeding soundness, meaning reproductive exam and physical exam parameters. Um, it's a current evaluation of breeding ability. So it tells us what they're doing as of today. And we have a lot of things we can measure and a lot of things we can look at, but there's really no single diagnostic test that's gonna accurately predict fertility. That being said, we can use all these things we can measure and assess together and say, well, yes, based on our assessment, he should be able to satisfactorily breed um, his share of cows this season. Or we might find an injury or some place that he fails in saying, well, no, he's not meeting our minimum standards. We need to try and find a replacement. And the way that we conduct these and that the standard is set um, by um, a veterinary reproductive society that sets these uh, standards, it's expected that on average about 10% of bulls will not pass these. And while it may seem like a, a large number when you first hear it and you think, well, gosh, I don't want my bulls to not pass this exam. Really, those are the bulls we're looking for, right? Um, I'm, I'm sad to say there, there are too many males in the world, right? And in livestock breeding, of course. And we are looking for the best of the best in theory to breed to our cows and heifers. And so we don't wanna be relying on the bottom rung of bulls if they're not meeting the minimum standards that we have determined contribute to fertility. So the purpose of this exam is to find those bulls and do it at a time in which you have enough time to replace that bull if necessary. So we often recommend doing these about 30 to 60 days before the expected breeding season. And many bulls that are sold in sales will come with a very recent breeding status exam that's been performed. So it's a comprehensive assessment of a bull's breeding potential. It really is more than just a semen check, right? We're not just getting a semen sample, looking at it real quick and saying yes or no based on whether we see motility. It's gonna be a physical and a reproductive exam, um, looking at confirmation, predisposing factors that might set them up for lameness or injury or the inability to find cows um, in heat and breed them. So if they have active pink eye, active pneumonia, actively lame, a swollen joint, um, th those are gonna factor into this. Um, we will collect semen, so we'll get a chance to look at his penis and prep use. Uh, we'll look, do a reproductive exam with scrotal circumference, scrotal contents, um, and we may incorporate venereal disease testing, such as TRIC, into this. Um, the one thing that we really want to see, of course, you know, the um, ability and desire to put it into the cow would be libido. And while we talk about it a lot, we really don't have a good way to measure it other than turning them out with the cow in heat and seeing if he breeds her. 
So the current standards that we use actually were just updated in 2018, um, but there have been various uh, standards really since the, uh, the early 50s for breeding status exams. And the reason we put emphasis into this um, is this. If we're gonna think about a breeding season and think about what we really wanna see, and in this example, we're having the bull in for about three cow cycles. So that'd be just over you know, 60 to 65 days um, of a breeding window. Uh, we would like to see a good two thirds of them breed up on their first cycle if all the cows are actively cycling and healthy and the bull is, uh, a, as a, uh, is a sound breeder. What that's gonna do is allow the second and third cycles to have many fewer animals coming into heat and give them a better chance to clean those up. So that we're actually aiming really for you know an 88 to 90 percent pregnancy rate by the end of the uh, season in an ideal um, an ideal system. If we're having problems, we might see a different distribution of breeding, which will lead to a different distribution of calving. Right. So ideally, we'd be seeing the majority of calves born um, in the beginning of the calving window versus the middle or the end. And so if we're seeing problems with the bull, whether it might be venereal disease, maybe he has energy or mineral deficiencies, uh, maybe he um, is competing with other bulls uh, and not getting the job done, he's, he's fighting instead. Uh, we might see a distributed breeding season where we're not getting the majority done right away, but we're seeing bulls bred throughout the entire window that he's in with heifers or cows. We could even see something more dramatic where we have a lot of opens at the end, but we had a lot of cows that bred up right after he was turned in with cows. And so this is an example of something that might happen after um, we had a bull failure mid-season. So he was going, starting to have a good breeding season and then got injured, um, got sick, something where he either stopped producing viable sperm or stopped being able to breed in an efficient way. So we can use our, if we're you know checking ages at preg check, which sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't, um, but certainly retrospectively looking back at a cat after a calving season to say, wow, you know, did the bulls do what they needed to do and did they do it in an efficient manner? So that's why we want to make sure that he uh, is meeting all of our minimum standards at the beginning of this season. Um, libido and mating ability, as I mentioned, it's the one thing that we really have a hard time measuring other than turning him out and seeing what he does with cows. But this can be affected by a lot of different things, um, one of which would be his age and his social status. So we know that young animals may still be learning how to breed, learning how to mount, um, and may very easily be, um, their libido may be suppressed by the presence of dominant males or older males in the herd. We see this commonly where older bulls will not let the younger bulls breed cows or heifers. We also will see them, we'll, they'll fight them off in cows and heat, and um, the young animals will actually be, for lack of a better word, be intimidated by the older bulls. Um, so if you're bringing in young bulls with new genetics that you want to get into the herd, they may only breed a, a small proportion of the herd, whereas the older bulls that have some lag time uh, in their genetic progress uh, would be breeding the majority there. And that's been shown in different studies where they've looked at single versus multiple bull breeding groups using the same number of bulls. Um, when you have all of them together and have some competition, sometimes you get a slightly lower pregnancy rate than you would in a, when you have one bull in the, the same proportion of the same number of cows on his own and actually has the ability to breed them when he should. Um, general health and nutrition, of course, is going to factor into this, um, whether they're over-conditioned or under-conditioned. You know, we see over-conditioned bulls often not have the physical ability to do the type of breeding and mounting that we expect them to. And under-conditioned thin bulls um, may not be, have the stamina to get through the uh, breeding season either. You know, we expect them to lose one to two body condition scores during the breeding season. So we want to have them in good flesh at the beginning of the season, um, knowing that there's going to be a lot of physical activity, a lot of walking, and they may not eat as much during that period while they're actively seeking out cows and heat and potentially challenging their own social status with more dominant males. And then of course, uh, the environment. So we often talk about functional male infertility. So you have the right number of bulls in with these cows, but because of terrain issues, whether it's steep and rugged terrain, whether it's um, just the, the geographic area is too big for these cows and bulls to meet up, 
they might not be able to service the cows uh, in an efficient manner. Okay, so the breeding status exams that we perform, um, again, ideally 30 to 60 days before the breeding season, um, and certainly at or just before uh, a sale. Um, again, these are the standards that are updated in 2018, uh, but they go back to the early 50s, and we have quite humble beginnings. <laughs> and so um, this is scrotal frostbite. And scrotal frostbite is actually what led to the development of what we now know as the Society for Theriogenology, which is this, this um, veterinary reproduction organization. Um, and it goes back to a blizzard in 1949 in the Rocky Mountains outside of Fort Collins, where this horrible blizzard came through. Um, and the next season, ranchers and veterinarians uh, noticed that there was a much lower pregnancy rate in the cows that year than they previously experienced. And the short version of the story is that it led veterinarians at what's now Colorado State University to go out and try to figure out a way to assess the reproductive status of bulls. And so they looked at the scrotums, they actually tried to map out these frostbite lesions and see if they correlated with pregnancy rates and stuff. Um, and that generally evolved into the standards that we have uh, today. So certainly you know, in some regions of California, so uh, we may have issues with frostbite, but for the majority of California, it's not gonna be the same extent as other Western states there. But it is gonna be a, something that we look for. So after the cow, uh, the bull is in the chute um, and we know that he's physically fit, you know, no signs of pink eye, pneumonia, no lameness, um, we'll start with a scrotal palpation and a scrotal circumference. So we'll palpate the contents, make sure that the testes and epididymi that are there to mature sperm after sperm development feel normal and symmetrical. We don't have any inflammation or masses or um, intestine coming down, like in the case of a hernia, no abscesses, that sort of thing. And make sure there are no wounds um, that we can see on the scrotum itself. We'll then take a scrotal circumference measurement. So we measure the widest part of the scrotum, which is going to contain all scrotal contents. And we do this for a very specific reason, because we don't usually measure concentration of sperm when we're doing our checks, unless we're collecting semen to freeze and sell or prepare for something else. So we know that the circumference of the scrotum is directly proportional to the size of his testicles. And the size of the testicles is directly proportional to the amount of sperm he's gonna produce on a daily basis. So we know that we can correlate the scrotal circumference with daily sperm production and use that as an estimator um, of his ability to breed a certain number of cows. So we have minimum standards, and this is for all breeds, even though you know, I know there are many breed variations on scrotal size and testicular size within beef cattle. But by the time they're 15 months, we want them to be at least 30 centimeters in circumference. And by the time all breeds are two years old, we expect them to be at least 34 centimeters in circumference um, to meet our minimum standards. And again, oftentimes they greatly exceed this, but those are our, our minimum standards. Um, we will then uh, do a semen collection. So we'll typically use electro ejaculation. So it is a probe, as you've likely seen, that's inserted into the rectum of the bull and it, it does not shock them, um, but it stimulates um, nerves right around where some of their accessory sex glands are internally. Um, and it basically leads them to get a full erection, protrusion and ejaculation. So very commonly done, um, uh, typically very atraumatic. Um, you know, we look, there's varying literature out there about the use of electroejaculation, um, And there's no conclusive evidence that it is painful or any stress, more stressful than being in a shoot um, itself. And so when used appropriately, I, I don't see a problem using this for our routine breeding channels exams. This does give us a chance to examine the penis and prep use for any injuries or masses or problems that you might have during breeding. And then we will collect a semen sample to look at sperm motility and sperm morphology. Um, and so we'll take initially a drop of raw semen, put it under the microscope that we'll have there. And we are gonna look for this, um, we call it gross motility. So it's gonna be all the sperm together, undiluted, and we're looking for these thick, um, rapid swirls as all the sperm sort of move around under our, our microscope view. 
will then dilute it out, a little bit of saline, um, and we'll look for what we call individual progressive motility. So this individual progressive motility is now giving us the ability to examine the sperm as they move on their own and not be buffered and pushed around by other sperm. And this is actually very telling for what he's producing. So we won't any more rely on the gross motility so much as we will this individual progressive motility. And we expect that any bull will have a minimum 30% individual progressive motility um, when we collect him. Now that might sound low and it, it kind of is. Most of the bulls we collect very routinely have 70, 80, 90% individual progressive motility, but the standards are set to be very practical. And we know we're often doing bull testing in cold weather, windy weather. Um, and so it's meant to account for some subpar field conditions that we're gonna be evaluating these guys in. So that's why we have those standards set there. So that's the first step on our semen evaluation is to see if we have sperm motility. The next, and um, what I would argue is more important than motility, would be the sperm morphology. So now that we know they're modal, that's, that's fantastic. Um, but now we need to make sure that they've been formed normally and have a normal appearance under the microscope. If they don't, we can start to look back and isolate where in the, the bull's scrotum or where in the bull's reproductive tract these abnormalities are coming from. There are very characteristic problems with sperm morphology that originate in the testicle, originate in the epididymis while the sperm are either maturing or sitting there waiting to be ejaculated. Um, if we see other cells like white blood cells, that could mean there's some kind of infection or inflammation somewhere in the bull's reproductive tract. So we can learn a lot about how these sperm are being formed by putting a stain on these sperm, killing them, and looking at their morphology. And as you can see on the, the, um, the image on the left, we're going to look at the head, which is where all the DNA is contained, as well as a bunch of enzymes that let that sperm actually burrow into the egg at fertilization and, and fertilize. Um, that little mid piece where we have a lot of um, energy generation for the tail to move, and then of course the tail itself. So this is what um, it looks like when we get underneath um, under the microscope. So on the left, most of those sperm um, are normal bull sperm. Uh, on the right, you can see some things like a, a coiled tail. I'm just gonna get my pointer here. Um, so these are gonna be some normal sperm here. Uh, we have things like a terminally coiled tail. We might see these little proximal droplets. So uh, these are gonna be evidence that the sperm is a little bit immature and probably shouldn't be ejaculating yet. Very common abnormality that we see on yearling bulls at their first test. or older bulls that are starting to have some kind of testicular degeneration or other problems that we're gonna see in terms of producing mature sperm. If we see sperm like this that have these little divots and dimples in the, the head, I'm gonna worry about the integrity of the DNA that's packaged underneath them and whether that sperm is gonna be able to carry, um, carry the DNA to the egg, fertilize appropriately and have conception um, or whether we're gonna have other issues or whether there are mutations and it's not packaged properly. And then we have some sperm defects that we know can be heritable in different breeds. This is actually what's called a DAG defect and it goes back to a, a Jersey bull on the dairy side of things years ago where we have basically the entire mid piece and tail is all curled up on itself. And as you can imagine, that's not gonna get the job done. It's not gonna be able to propagate itself through the reproductive tract of the cow. So I said, most of these are normal. One of them that's abnormal is actually up here by my, by my uh, marker here. So I want to see if you can appreciate that the tip of that sperm head is kind of concave and divoted as compared to all the others. It's a subtle finding, but it's an important one. That part of the sperm is what has all these enzymes that allows that sperm to penetrate into the egg through this, uh, this pretty rigid shell that's around the egg for lack of a better term. Um, and, get, and actually have fertilization happen. With this happens, this is called a knob acrosome. Those enzymes are not present in their normal concentrations or as they should be. So that sperm might get to the egg, but not actually be able to fertilize it because it can't penetrate through there. So by finding these, and one or two, I'm not gonna be concerned about. If we have the majority of sperm having these abnormalities, then we worry about the fertilizing ability of that bull. 
So we want to um, have 70% normal morphology for a bull to pass his breeding sales exam. So then we can look at some of the abnormalities, whether they're inherited abnormalities, injuries, that sort of thing um, during this exam. So one thing we might see would be this band of tissue that is going across here. This is what's called a persistent frenulum. And there are varying degrees, shapes, sizes, et cetera. As you can see here, these are two, two bulls. Um, what this is, this is, there's a, a normally a, a very small band of tissue that connects the free end, that tip of the penis, back to the sheath um, of the penis uh, when they're born. And as they go through puberty, that breaks down and they get full extension and erection of the penis. If this is present like this after puberty, this is an abnormality. Because as you can imagine, he may not be able to exteriorize or extend his penis outside of the sheath. He may not be able to retract it back into the sheath. And he is not likely to be able to actually penetrate and breed a cow. So we certainly can surgically correct these by cutting that band. But there is a lot of evidence that these are heritable in many breeds. And so I really don't recommend breeding bulls that have a persistent frenulum if we're testing them over a year of age. There are some caveats. Certainly, you know, we do see people use some of these bulls that we've corrected in terminal crosses. So, you know, if those animal, those um, steers or heifers are going off to um, to market and to slaughter, then that's probably just fine. But I wouldn't recommend keeping any replacement bulls out of a bull that had a persistent frenulum at one point. We may see things like penile warts. So caused by a, a papillomavirus that's very contagious in cattle. Um, in the young bull, an occasional word or two isn't a big deal, but it may cause bleeding at the time of erection, or if they're large enough, it may actually prohibit them from mounting a full erection and breeding. And so um, we often will go ahead and remove these during a breeding sounds exam, recheck them a couple weeks later. If it's cleared up, then let him go and no harm is done. We may see hair rings or other, you know, um, uh, concreted dirt and manure that clog up around the free end of the penis that we can alleviate. We may see a laceration or a fresh wound. This is actually one that's being corrected in surgery. Or we may see abnormalities in the penile shape. So as you imagine, this corkscrew penis won't allow that bull to actually achieve intromission and breed the cow appropriately. I will say that this. Um, does happen on a very minor extent naturally. Once he's in the cow and ejaculating, then that his penis does tend to twist a little bit. But if it's happening before he gets in, that's certainly uh, an abnormality. Oh, I see. Sorry, I see there are a couple of questions here. Um, one question: um, What is the normal age range for productive bulls? Does it differ among breeds? That's a good question. Um, that would be. Typically, once they are, um, well, in our boss Taurus breed, so most of our, you know, um, Angus, Hereford, um, Charlet, et cetera, a lot of our um, both continental and English breeds, uh, after 12 to 15 months of age, they can breed a small number of cows, right? After they've gone through puberty, which is anywhere from nine to 12 months, depending on factors, um, they should be able to go. We do see our Brahmin, Zebu, you know, those um, influenced breeds, go through puberty a little bit later. So they might not go through puberty until 15 or 16 months of age. So we often don't recommend breeding them until at least 18 to 20 months of age because we may be breeding them uh, prematurely. Um, okay. So either during a breeding sounds exam or during an exam, just when we're checking bulls that are out breeding, we may come across some injuries. Um, one would be something that would look like this, which is going to be a, a penile hematoma, often referred to as a broken penis. And that's a very accurate description because that's what it is. Um, this is an injury that's sustained during breeding where the bull is going to mount. And for whatever reason, he misses, the cow or the heifer moves, um, something happens and he misses penetrating the cow and actually instead hits his erect penis on the backside of the cow. Now, um, they have a very rigid, long, skinny penis that's very, um, it's engorged with very high pressure blood when they're breeding. If they hit something solid, 
it can literally flex and snap like that. And what happens is that we get all this blood rushing out around the penis and it causes this big hematoma, as you can see here um, and on the Holstein on the right. It's gonna be this big swelling that's just in front of the scrotum, but behind that propuscial or that sheath opening. And it happens very quickly and he is not gonna be able to extend and he may actually prolapse his penis a bit at, and it might hang out after that. We'll also see an abscesses, like a propucial abscess that can look similar, where instead of having a traumatic injury to the penis, they actually get this separation and abscess sort of between the bottom part of their abdomen and that free sheath. It's in that, that no man's land right there. Um, it can look very similar. They both have similar consequences where they render the bull um, in it, unable to breed at the moment. Now, if these are caught early and they're small, they can often be managed medically with um, antibiotics, anti-inflammatory uh, anti drugs, um, some other topical therapies and things. If they're extremely large or they're chronic, they may require surgery to really shell out that hematoma, try to fix the rent in the penis and get him back into breeding. Whatever happens, he's out of commission for this breeding season um, instantly. And really it's gonna be his value, the price of replacement bulls and the prognosis based on how severe the injury is as to whether you wanna pursue treatment or not. Sometimes we do recommend culling these bulls and replacing them, but there are medical and surgical options that we can pursue um, if, if it's warranted to do so. And we're happy to of course um, provide that service as are um, many veterinarians of course in the state. While we're on um, breeding injuries, um, who has seen this before? And allow me to orient you. Uh, this is the, uh, I can't see. Um, this is looking underneath the bull and this is looking at his um, sheath. What this is, um, is a propucial prolapse. So under the bull, you have the penis that is in, in kind of housed in this sheath or prepuce. When they get erect and breed, it comes out of the prepuce, they breed and it go, retracts and goes back into the prepuce. If there's a penile or a propucial injury, then um, any type of wound creates a lot of inflammation, creates a lot of swelling. And because that swelling is so low on his abdomen, that starts to draw in more inflammation and more swelling. So we get this very congested swollen sheath or prepuce that becomes more and more pendulous and actually predisposes him to injuring it even more. This could be a breeding injury. It could be because he stepped on it. It could be because another bull stepped on it. It could be because he caught it on a fence trying to breed someone he shouldn't be. Um, there are different things that can happen. Either way, um, sometimes the penis is perfectly unaffected, but the sheath is now swollen and infected. So we can do a lot of uh, medical management to reduce the swelling, clear up the infection and return that back to a useful state. Um, if there's a penile injury, we can certainly um, address that. Sometimes though, we'll clean these up and they're left with this circular scar that goes around um, the sheath. And so even though it's all healed in, it's still too narrow of an opening that the bull cannot get his penis out. So in that case, there are surgeries that can be done to remove that fibrous scar, but it becomes, it becomes um, more involved to, to do that. I see a question over here. I was going back on um, the usual end of the productive breeding age of bulls. I mean, many bulls can easily still be breeding at nine or 10 years of age. Um, it's really gonna, and if we have good longevity and good management factors, we might get to that point. The problem is we don't necessarily want to always have those same genetics and he's gonna be often related to much of the replacement herd at that point. So we often see um, by choice uh, about four years of use before people are really turning those bulls over. But there's no reason he cannot continue to breed if he's in good health and good soundness to be much older. Okay. So certainly that propitial prolapse, something that we can manage, but it's again going to compromise his ability to breed right now. Okay. So in the end, um, if he's uh, physically fit, if he has met all the minimum standards, we'll classify him as a satisfactory potential breeder. Um, if he has something wrong and he doesn't pass already, but we think it's a temporary condition or it's improving, then we'll defer him, check him again later. But if he fails in any one of the um, 
the parameters, he's going to be deemed an unsatisfactory potential breeder. And you know, there's not, that doesn't mean that he still can't get cows pregnant, but he's not meeting our minimum standards. And I would not recommend buying a bull that's been dubbed an unsatisfactory potential breeder. Okay. Um, at the same time, we may consider testing for venereal diseases. And so you've likely um, you know, heard of Vibrio and Trick. So Vibrio would be a specific bacteria called Campylobacter fetus venerealis. And Trick is a protozoa called Tritrichomonas fetus. Both of these follow a very similar pattern of disease. Um, in both cases, the bull is the carrier. So the bull carries these on the surface of his penis and prepuce. Um, the bull, does not have any clinical signs or any symptoms of disease. It's very effective. They are very effectively transmitted at the time of breeding. And the female is going to suffer the consequences of the infection and then will shed the organism for a short period of time. I'm just going to look at the, the question and answer again. Um, would you recommend trying to treat the prolapse before just writing him off and selling him for salvage? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, I would recommend trying medical management because many of them will resolve. Um, without needing surgery. Why are we concerned about things like trichomonas fetus? Okay. This is what trick looks like under the microscope. Um, and so it is this little one-celled protozoa, again, that lives on the surface of the penis and prepuce, um, that gets into the reproductive tract at the time of breeding. Um, conception is still going to occur so we still have fertilization of the egg and that embryo makes it into the uterus, but then the female mounts this huge immune response. And so we get this big pus filled uterus, often called a pyometra. Um, and that pus filled uterus actually kills off the, um, the conceptus or the embryo. So we have it in California as many Western states do. Um, Dr. Bondurant, who um, is retired, um, reproductive veterinarian here from Davis, uh, did a lot of work with Trick in the 80s and the 90s. And that was when he was really trying to characterize what it was doing and the prevalence. And in 1989, he had a study estimating that about 16% of beef herds in California, which equaled about 5% of all bulls tested, were positive for trichomonas fetus. In 2020, um, based on the samples that were submitted to the CABS Diagnostic Lab in California, about 0.3% um, of all bulls sampled and submitted there were positive. So we've come down considerably in the level, but we do still have ongoing herds that um, have trick in them. It's not a zoonotic disease. It does not pose any human health risks, um, but it does have huge economic consequences for a herd if it gets in. So some risk factors for bulls that you know, would predispose them to trick. We know that older bulls are more likely to have it than younger bulls uh, by twofold. One, they tend to have more redundant tissue and extra folding of tissue on their prep use. So they have these nice, dark, warm, moist areas that trick like to live. And just by being an older bull, they've likely bred more cows and have had more chances to have been exposed over their breeding lifetime. Um, we know shared grazing risks will increase because um, if we are commingling cows and bulls of unknown status, then of course it's going to increase the risk for others. Um, using leased or rented bulls without um, proper testing. Purchasing cull cows. So we know that cows can, can shed that organism after they've been infected for a short period of time and can serve as an infection source for bulls in the herd. And then either unintentional commingling or bad fences. If we think we have animals separated, but in fact we don't, then we can have unintended consequences there. Um, so like I said, what Trick does, this is a little um, uh, microscopic image of Trick, and you can see all these little hairs and flagella that move it around. Um, it, conception still occurs, we get a big inflammatory response in the cow's uterus, and then the outcome is fetal death or embryonic death. Typically, we're going to have these losses happen in the first month and a half or so after breeding. So this is going to happen relatively quickly. She'll eventually clear that infection um, and eventually have a short immunity that she can breed back to that same bull, but it's going to delay the breeding in the breeding season. And we might see cows being bred right before you pull the bulls and then, of course, calving right at the end of your calving window.
So we do a lot of testing for this. Um, we often do it at the time of breeding sinus exams. We also will do it for um, sales, public and private sales and interstate transport. So the male will have him sexually rested 10 days before, and then we'll take a dry little pipette and scrape the inside of his sheath to get a bunch of smegma um, that we'll examine and analyze for a trick. We don't often test females. So we don't test heifers and cows routinely unless they have the pyometra. If they have that pus-filled uterus that we detect on rectal palpation or at the time of preg check, we'll often get a sample of that pus and, and submit it to make sure that it's not trick. And to submit samples, um, veterinarians are required to do it. Um, and these veterinarians have to be approved and be recertified every two years for sampling and submitting tests to the diagnostic lab to be an official test. At the time of testing, we will apply a trick tag. So every, all the Western states now are harmonious in their colors and their trick year. So this just means that that bull was trick tested in the trick year, which I'll talk about in a second. And of course we um, link that up to an official government ID, whether it's a silver bright tag or an RFID tag. And we'll often use these in pouch kits that have this media in them to put the smegma in um, to then either run a culture or a PCR test. When we're sampling for trick, again, we have our two choices. Um, we can do cultures where we're just examining that sample under the microscope every day for about six days and incubating it in between to encourage anything to grow. But we do have a lot of false positives and false negatives there. The most common false positive would be other tricks um, that look the same that do not cause this disease that we're talking about. So the whole family of trichomonad organisms and protozoa, uh, they have other ones that are often found in diarrhea or in the normal GI tract of, of cattle, but those aren't the ones we want. So if we see this under a microscope, we'll automatically then run a PCR test. And because of that, the PCR test is quickly becoming the standard for interstate and regulatory testing. And so this quantitative PCR, what it does is it just amplifies any DNA that's present and then looks for DNA that's specific to Trichomonas fetus, which is the one that causes TRIC. It weeds out all these other ones that would look the same under the microscope. The problem is if we have sample handling issues and the pouch on the bottom is actually kind of poofed up and gassed up, because we had a lot of bacterial contamination at the time of sampling, that can actually kill trick and make it unable to detect um, on a test. So treatment and control of trick, there is no legal effective treatment for trick. Um, and so that bull cannot be sold for breeding purposes and needs to go into either an approved feedlot that's gonna go on to slaughter or be sold for slaughter only. Um, and so we've, that's why we put so much emphasis on routine testing and prevention. There is a vaccination available through Boeing or Ingelheim called TrickGuard that's labeled for use in cows. And I don't recommend this for everyone, but if you are having problems with trick in your herd, or you have neighbors or you're grazing with people who have trick um, that you know about, then this can help boost the immunity in your cow herd. Um, it will not prevent the cow from getting infected, but what it will do is help her clear the infection must much faster so that she can then breed again, conceive, and carry a cow calf to term. So overall, if you had one herd that was vaccinating and another that was not, and they both had exposure to trick, the one that was vaccinating will, on average, have a higher pregnancy rate at the end of the breeding season than the herd that did not. Um, it does not have a label claim for bulls, and there's really, it's, it's safe, it wouldn't hurt the bulls, but there's limited evidence to show that it actually can prevent trick in bulls. And so it's not something to rely on to keep your bulls clean here. After natural infection, cows will be immune to this for about six or eight months, but then the next breeding season, they're going to be susceptible again, which is why we can see trick year after year um, when it's um, in cows that are suffering from it one year to the next. Um, the CDFA regulations, um, California actually had the first trick control program in the country in 2003, and then it's been updated multiple times since. Um, and so current standards are that any bulls over 18 months of age 
or any non-virgin bulls, so bulls that have been with heifers and they're under 18 months of age, um, must be test negative within 60 days of entering California. That PCR test is required for that, for it selling bulls either through public or private sales, for pasture to pasture permits. Um, and if you've been exposed to a, um, a positive animal or a positive bull, then that's required for um, testing all the other bulls that may have been exposed. That culture is still allowed for some herd-based um, screening and uh, evaluation, and it's used in a lot of our bull studs and semen collection facilities. There are some exemptions to testing, so animals moving for exhibition only or non-breeding or into approved um, channels for, um, for slaughter, then they don't have to be tested beforehand. And there are regulations for if there has been a trick positive in the herd, then subsequent testing is required by the state after that. The, as I said, the trick tags go in every year um, and they change every year. So the next year we'll cut that tag out and put another one in for the current trick year, which runs September 1st to August 31st to try and um, encompass breeding seasons. Um, it doesn't tell you whether they're positive or negative. It just tells you they've been tested that year but the, um, the CDFA will follow up with positive bulls and talk to um, you about what to do with that bull. Like I said, um, similar to that is Vibrio or Campylobacter fetus venerealis. Uh, fairly similar to Trick, except it's gonna cause a, a pregnancy loss a little bit later in pregnancy, so an early fetal loss. Um, this is unfortunately often not diagnosed until preg check. And again, we're having a low pregnancy rate. And we have this longer immunity that these cows get. So we often get this fluctuating pregnancy rate from one year to the next. And so it might not be very obvious that there's a problem here. Um, we will see this occasionally in unvaccinated herds, but in all honesty, we don't have a good assessment of prevalence in California because we, ha we haven't done a large scale study yet recently to see what types of um, numbers that we get. It's a very common bacteria though that's out there. And the, likely the reason we don't see as many problems with it is because we tend to vaccinate for it quite well. Cows do develop a longer immunity after vaccination or after natural infection as compared to trick. And there are vaccines available. So um, one that can be used would be this Vibrin. So this is this oil-based um, vaccine gonna create a huge lump and a huge reaction but it does stimulate the immune system quite well. It's good for use in bulls and cows. And actually uh, it's been shown in young bulls, uh, giving a double dose twice, so four weeks apart, can actually uh, be curative and clear the bull of Campylobacter fetus venerealis. Um, older bulls, it's less effective in doing that. Um, there are other vaccines. So the Vibrin is the one on the left, that oil-based one. But most of our combination vaccines um, have an option that has Vibrio in it. Um, and they have different adjuvants and different products in them. Um, and they're still effective. Um, just don't have that label claim for bulls to actually induce a clearance of the disease. Now, I want to show you something. And again, I don't work for a pharmaceutical company. I'm not trying to badmouth any companies at all. Um, but this is a product of Irish Shield um, 6VL5. Um, and you can see this actually contains Vibrio. And the way that we can tell, is it's going to mention Campylobacter fetus up here in the label, but these labels can often look very similar and be hard to read. So many of the vaccines will have a V in the name. So in general, if you have a V in the actual brand name, it probably contains Vibrio. But they also have products that look exactly the same. So this is VirusShield 6L5 no V in the name, this does not contain Vibrio. So when you're selecting combination vaccines, please be careful and make sure you're using the product that you wanna be using because we have seen actually Vibrio and Campylobacter problems in herds that accidentally switched from a Vibrio containing vaccine to a non-Vibrio containing vaccine. And about two years after that, we realized we were starting to have problems. So something to be aware of when you're, when you're doing vaccine conversations with your veterinarian or shopping either um, at feed stores or online for specific products. Okay, 
Um, just a, a brief word about the nutritional management of bulls to try and you know, help us with our longevity and help with good overall um, well, health. In general, there aren't going to be um, specific recommendations for energy and protein levels beyond what you would typically be feeding the cow herd, right? Um, we know that younger bulls tend to be more susceptible to severe deficiencies, either in energy, protein, or trace minerals than mature bulls, like most young animals are because they're going to be growing, they have higher requirements, and when they're going through puberty and having initial sexual maturity and development, we want everything to be appropriate. Um, we are going to want to begin the breeding season, roughly if we look at body condition scores, at about a six or a seven out of nine, because we know that those bulls are going to lose one to two condition scores on average because of, again, all the physical activity and um, often eating a little bit less than they normally would because of all that extra physical activity. Some of the concerns we have both with underconditioned or overconditioned bulls um, certainly are there. When they're growing and young, of course, underconditioning is going to be a problem. Once they're mature, if they have a temporary or um, period where they have a slight or moderate deficiency of energy or protein, there are often relatively minimal effects on reproductive health. So minimal effects on sperm production, minimal effects on libido, all of that. But when we get into severe de deficiencies or prolonged deficiencies, that's where you start to see altered hormone balances, lower sperm production, decreased libido, likely as a consequence of the altered hormone production. And we start to be concerned about the reproductive system starting to shut down in order to preserve more critical systems for the bull's life. But on the overconditioned side, we don't want fat bulls either, right? Um, if they're overconditioned, then we start to see a tendency for um, no willingness to breed, decreased sexual activity. Sometimes they just can't physically walk around and mount as often as they would if they were at a, a moderate body condition score. We actually may see impaired sperm production as well in these extreme cases, because as we start to accumulate fat all around the body, bulls will also accumulate fat in the neck of their scrotum and within their scrotum to a slight degree. It's enough though to affect the ability of that scrotum to regulate the temperature of the testicles. And the whole purpose of a scrotum is to be there to regulate the temperature because sperm need to develop a couple degrees below body temperature. So if we don't, if we're insulated and don't have the ability to, to cool them, then we can actually see decreased sperm quality. Along with energy and protein levels, of course, and conditioning comes mineral deficiencies. And of course, anyone running cattle in California knows that we battle mineral deficiencies um, constantly. And I'm just going to touch on three, uh, copper, selenium, and zinc, because they're the ones that um, we see problems with in California, and they all have uh, implications for the reproductive system. So again, um, copper deficiency, um, this is a map actually um, from UC Extension looking at soil concentrations of minerals um, years ago. And so certainly you can see the soil concentration of minerals and the, um, the pH of soils and various factors will influence the uptake of minerals into grasslands or you know, hay production, that sort of thing. And so we know we are borderline marginal and deficient in a lot of California, as are many Western states. Um, copper is extremely important though for growth and development of the animal, immune system function, um, normal metabolism, um, and of course, pigment deposition. We'll see one of the signs, of course, being this thin, um, you know, light coat on dark animals. And this, the clinical signs of deficiency are often very nonspecific, right? I mean, we'll see weight loss, diarrhea, different degrees of infertility on the male and female side. Um, anemia, we might see really weak bones that might lead to spontaneous bone fractures. And again, a weak immune system. So they might not respond to vaccination appropriately. They may not be able to um, fight off disease as, the, as an immunocompetent or an animal that had a functional immune system may be able to do. So a supplementation, we have a couple options. Um, Salt mix supplementations are often um, a good place. Um, we are, we are, we're not going to get into you know, chelated versus non-chelated or organics versus or inorganics and all these things tonight. 
Um, but certainly, um, if we do have some chelated copper, sometimes it forms, um, it can actually be an increased absorption because it's not going to form all these other complexes with other minerals that may prevent um, absorption. The problem with chelated copper or organic minerals is it's often much more expensive and can be cost prohibitive to supplement on a large scale. Um, orally, there are ruin boluses that are available. So these are just little copper oxide blunt needles that are in a big gel cap. And giving them as a bolus, they sit down and wedge in the reticulum and the rumen of the, the bull or the cow. And they break down over about six to eight months and have this nice slow copper release. It's going to provide roughly three to four milligrams of copper a day, um, makes its way into the small intestine and gets absorbed. And so it can be an effective way to supplement copper. Um, and then we do have injectable products. Um, and just as a general rule, um, if we're talking about mineral supplementation, oral sources, whether there is a bolus or as a constant salt or mineral mix that the animals can eat, um, are going to give you more sustained levels and better supplementation long term than many of our injectable products. So while we do give injectable products, um, Multimin would be a good example where it has um, you know, multiple minerals that we're looking to supplement, we'll have an initial spike in, in levels that get into the animal, but there's not a lot of longevity after that spike. And so in the short term, it helps, but in all reality, oral supplementation is going to give you um, more bang for your buck, uh, I think in the long run, if you're battling severe deficiencies. We also have problems with selenium, of course, um, in California. And since the 60s, we've known that um, we have these selenium responsive conditions like white muscle disease that we often talk about, right? This is where the developing calf um, is growing um, when the cow is selenium deficient. And in severe cases, we can see skeletal muscle and the heart muscle actually be so weak that they can't um, thrive. Um, we can also see this manifest in older animals as being stiff, reluctant to move, lame, um, and at slaughter or at necropsy, we might see pale muscles. Um, we know that on the reproductive side that we, on the female and the male aspect of reproduction, see problems with selenium deficiency. On the female, we might see various infertility manifestations, and we may see um, embryonic loss and abortions mid-pregnancy. On the male, we know that selenium is important for sperm production and sperm maturity, so we might actually see lower sperm motility and lower fertilizing capability of sperm in severely deficient bulls. Again, we can see diarrhea and general ill thrift, just like many other things that can often look the same. And again, altered immune system function because it changes how white blood cells actually work in the animal. So again, supplementation, um, same concepts apply. We do have injectable formulations. So uh, Multimin has selenium, BOCI and MUSI are all good selenium injectable sources. And when used at label doses, all of those products are supplying the same amount of selenium to the animal. They all have different label doses though, but when used appropriately, because of the different concentrations in the products, we're giving the same supplementation to the animal. This does supply, you know, partial selenium supplementation for at least 30 to 35 days. And after that, it starts to wane there. We also have rumen boluses available. So these can be minerals, um, elemental selenium that can be given to any ruminating animal. So calves have to be at least three months of age, if not a little bit older. But basically that again, sits down um, in the four stomachs of the bull or the cow and slowly breaks down and erodes over the course of a year or so and supplements about three milligrams per head per day. And then of course, there are many mineral salt mixes available and many commercially available products contain selenium salt. Um, and roughly cows and bulls are gonna eat three to four ounces per head per day. Legally, there are limitations on how much you can supplement selenium. So um, the three to four ounces per head per day um, typically is going to be from products that have selenium added into them because legally we can't supplement more than that three mg per, milligram per head per day concentration. And then zinc, um, I'm just gonna mention it because sometimes it gets overlooked. 
when we're talking about supplementation of mineral, we don't have the same degree of deficiency in a lot of our soils in, in California as we do with copper and selenium, but we do see some problems. Again, it's a component of almost every enzyme in the animal's body. It's everywhere. Um, and so deficiencies are gonna show very similar signs that the other things do. Compromised immune function, decreased sperm production, decreased libido, um, reduced birth weight of calves, that sort of thing. And um, again, it's incorporated into some of these multi-component um, mineral supplements, but the best way is gonna be with um, mineral mixes and oral salts that have zinc added to allow dietary absorption. With any minerals, you know, we can always assess the live animal for their status. You know, we can look at either blood samples, uh, we can do liver biopsies to look at um, mineral levels to see what the status of the herd is. And certainly if an animal dies and we do a necropsy, we'll use liver and kidney levels to assess their mineral level and use that as an extrapolation of what the overall herd level is gonna be. So it's always good information to know that we can then tweak and tailor our supplementation programs um, to get the most out of them. So I've been talking about energy, protein, um, mineral supplementation, it's all affecting immune system function. And so one way that we can then stimulate immune system function if you will, would be through appropriate vaccination programs. Um, the goals of any vaccination program, um, especially in bulls, will be to prevent disease, to reduce the incidence or severity of the disease, because we know not all vaccines are 100% effective and, and most are not. So if we can, even if we get disease in the animal, having a lower severity or a faster clearance and return to function is gonna be good. And of course, it allows us to reduce the use of antimicrobials or antibiotics. Um, the, the whole idea of a vaccination program is to expose the animal to disease and get their immune system ready to respond before we expect them to be exposed to that disease. So in the case of bulls, that's going to be in that pre-breeding window. So 30 to 60 days before bull turn in with the cows, um, we'd like to boost their vaccines. That gives them enough time to mount a response to the vaccine and then be ready to fight off anything they come in contact with. Um, we're going to vaccinate bulls very similar to how you vaccinate your cows, with the exception that we're not going to give them a brucellosis or a Bangs vaccine, and we're not going to be vaccinating them with the foothill abortion vaccine if you're using the foothill abortion vaccine. Um, a lot of things and a lot of factors can affect how well a bull or any animal responds to a vaccine or responds to disease. So age, nutrition, trace mineral status, the product you're using, um, previous vaccine history, environmental stress, a lot of things can factor in. And that's when we see vaccine breaks or vaccine failures, sometimes it becomes from one of these other competing factors that didn't allow for an appropriate response. Just some specific diseases. And again, a lot of these are going to be found in the standard combination respiratory and reproductive products that are on the market that we use commonly. So reproductive diseases like um, IBR and BVD, we'll see bacteria like uh, leptospirosis, and there are multiple components and multiple serovars or types of leptospirosis that we're concerned about. Um, and then Campylobacter. Um, I really recommend that all beef cows and beef bulls, in addition to their normal reproductive and respiratory disease and clostridial diseases, incorporate Vibrio into their vaccination plan. Because again, it's a common bacteria that's out there and we know that it's well controlled with appropriate vaccination plans. Respiratory disease, some of it's caused by the same viruses um, that cause reproductive disease, but we also have an influenza, PI3, um, and a syncytial virus, BRSV, that we see in cattle. We will see bacterial causes of pneumonia, so pastorella, anhymia, and histophilus. And so I do recommend that bulls have those incorporated in them as well, especially if they're going through a lot of temperature fluctuations. If they're up in the hills or in cold climates in the winter and then have warm summers, we really want to make sure that they have some protection for the bacterial pneumonia components on board. 
And the other category would be clostridial diseases. And so um, this is gonna incorporate things like black leg, tetanus, red water, um, overeating disease, clostridium provingens, C and D. Um, with the clostridial diseases, every, every cow, every bull should get a booster every year for this um, because they're so common. And without clostridial vaccination, we do see more black leg, we do see more tetanus, we do see more red water, we do see a lot of things that are otherwise preventable. Now, there are a lot of products out there. Most of these clostridial vaccines do not contain tetanus. And so things like the Covexin line and many others do contain tetanus if you're wanting to specifically vaccinate these cattle for tetanus. You often also see many products called a seven-way or an eight-way, right? Well, when we say a seven-way or an eight-way, that's usually referring to a clostridial vaccine. It's gonna incorporate these and a few others. The difference between a seven-way and an eight-way clostridial vaccine is almost always red water. So if you're living in an area or running cattle in an area that has a lot of irrigated pasture, if you're on um, along lakes, lake beds, along rivers that get kind of marshy, I would recommend having red water incorporated because that's a bacteria that loves to thrive um, actually in conjunction with liver flukes um, that can live in those same areas. So respiratory, repro, vibrio, and clostridial diseases should be standard for your bulls. Now there are other case-based optional vaccines depending on where you are, what risks, what risks you have, and what previous disease you've had. So things like anaplasma, if you're up in the foothills, um, we do see anthrax occasionally. That's really a case-by-case -case approach to vaccinating herds. Uh, trick vaccines and pink eye, which Dr. Angelos discussed last time. So other things to add in when necessary. When it comes to disease management, of course, we're not going to be able to prevent all disease, but early recognition and early treatment are going to be your best outcomes. And this is a place that you can really work well with your veterinarian to establish practical treatment protocols for common diseases, multiple causes of lameness, bloat, pneumonia, pink eye, GI issues, weight loss, nonspecific things. Having a first line of defense, you know, and a protocol you can work from can often help you out. You know, um, all antimicrobials are prescription only in California. And so um, we will often, you know, work with our clients to have a health protocol and then dispense antibiotics to be used in that herd along with that protocol. So you might not always have to call the vet for every single injury or illness if they can be treated by what you've already discussed and worked through um, common diseases like pneumonia, lameness, pink eye, et cetera. So it's really handy to have those um, handy and have that relationship with your veterinarian. When it comes to using those antimicrobials, though, we do want to promote judicious use of antibiotics and not just using them all over the place when they're not necessarily required. We, of course, don't want to withhold use. We need to use them when appropriate, but we do have different judicious use guidelines that we try to follow. We want to stick to products that are labeled for use in cows and cattle, and of course, follow appropriate withdrawal times. You know, if something is being treated, it's not going the way we want. We need to make sure if it's going into slaughter that we don't have a violative residue um, present when it goes off to the slaughterhouse. And what about the use of antibiotics in breeding bulls? I said there are a lot of antibiotics that are labeled for cattle. Most indications though are gonna be for respiratory disease, pink eye, foot rot. Those are the big drivers and the big uses of antimicrobials. We use them for other things um, that are very effective, but I do want to point out that most antibiotics actually have a statement on them saying that they are not either in, not intended for use in breeding animals or not um, have not been evaluated in breeding animals. And that's okay because we, we use these considerably in breeding bulls and breeding cows on the beef side of things um, with good success um, without severe adverse effects. Um, they're saying this because there haven't been large-scale research studies done to look at this. We do know anecdotally that prolonged use of some things like tetracyclines and macrolides can show diminished sperm production over time, but short-term use, three or four doses of an antibiotic, is not going to do that. I'd be more concerned about the fever and the inflammation that might have been associated with the disease you're treating 
that might affect sperm production and reproductive success more than the antibiotic. But just so you're aware, most antibiotics are designed for use really in feedlot cattle, um, pneumonia, pink eye, foot rot, that sort of thing. Um, and then anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, we don't see any evidence that these have any adverse effects when used appropriately in breeding animals. Um, a few are available to us. Um, we really don't use, recommend using aspirin much anymore because it's not that available in the rumen. And we have other products if we really want to knock down inflammation. Um, products like banamine, which have an injectable version that can be given IV, have a poron version that can be very easily given as a top line pour down the back. And that's incorporated often into many combination products like Resflor or Hexazole. That is an antibiotic and then banamine associated with it. You give it subcutaneously under the skin in animals and you can actually get a very easily, easy to administer anti-inflammatory. There's a new product out there um, called Draxin KP, which combines Draxin and an anti-inflammatory called Ketoprofen, which is new on the market. And it's quite exciting because it's a new crack classification of an anti-inflammatory drug we can use. Um, we do see another drug called meloxicam that does not have a labeled indication in cattle in the United States, um, but we will occasionally use it in an extra label manner. But that's something for you to discuss um, with your veterinarian on a case-by-case -case basis. So very helpful and very useful. And the last thing I'm gonna mention um, is just new bull biosecurity. So again, if you're buying virgin versus non-virgin bulls, you're gonna have different levels of risk. It's almost always safer to purchase a virgin bull as a replacement bull, one that has not been exposed to females post puberty. Whichever one we're gonna purchase though, um, we wanna have a quarantine once they come onto the facility because you don't wanna just turn them out with your normal bull battery or with your cows because if they're gonna break with disease, whether it's, um, pneumonia, whether it's pink eye, whether it's something else that's contagious, we want that to happen in those first 30 days so that we know it happens, let them get over it, and then move in when they're not contagious anymore. And this is going to be quarantined without direct contact of cows or other bulls. Uh, we always recommend a breeding science exam at purchase um, and then disease testing. So, I mean, I think trick testing, because we are still seeing it in California, it's a good insurance mechanism to know that that bull is not coming in with trick. And again, for public and private sales, it's required in California. Other things may fit into your overall herd management or herd biosecurity plan. If you're looking at Vibrio, Yonis, BBD, persistently infected calves, things like that, those bulls may be screened before you buy them or as a condition of purchase if you're really trying to control a certain disease within your herd. And I always like to know the vaccine history too, so that you know. Um, how they've been raised and most appropriate ways to boost them or start a new vaccination plan if they haven't had anything in a while. Um, and that's all I'm gonna say. Kind of a, just touching on a couple of different major points um, about bringing in bulls, maintaining bulls. There are a lot of, there's a lot more detail of course we could talk about and I could probably talk all night about some of this stuff because I think it's very interesting and very, um, very useful to discuss. Uh, but with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, one question. Oh, good question. Um, how many weeks does it take for sperm to develop maturity? Would two days of a high fever affect sperm development? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. The longer answer is that it takes about 60 days from the time a sperm starts to develop to the time that it's mature and ready to be ejaculated. So if you've had a really hot ambient temperature or you've had a significant fever, once that fever breaks, um, it's gonna be at 60 days from that point to where we get to a new, what we call spermatogenic cycle, where we have a new wave of mature sperm coming up. I will say though that um, the sperm that are being stored in that epididymis right before ejaculation tend to be a bit more resistant to heat stress than the developing sperm in the testicle. And what that practically means is that during or after a fever, you probably have a couple of days where you can still get some breeding, but then you're going to go into this trough where you're not going to have viable sperm potentially for a month and a half to two months. So continuing on that theme, Dr. McNabb, like there was a question that said, if you had a bull that had a successful fertility exam in on February 19th, 
how long is it considered useful? <laughs> Until something goes wrong. So that's the, um, you know, the asterisks we always put. It, we're evaluating his ability to be a successful breeder on that day. And after that, we really can't predict the future. So if he's had a lot of stress after that, if he's had fevers, other diseases, um, if he's been exposed to other animals that may have gotten him sick for whatever reason, it is going to be a risk. And unfortunately, like I said, we can't predict the future. And so it's giving a assessment at one point in time. So switching themes, can we use dexamethasone as an anti-inflammatory also? Good question. You can. Um, it's actually a very potent and uh, important anti-inflammatory agent that we have. Now, the only the problem with dexamethasone, um, it does not have inflammation. It does not provide any pain relief. So if you're using one of these anti-inflammatories to also control pain, it's not going to be effective. We also see when you add a steroid like dexamethasone, it's going to temporarily suppress the immune response of an animal. So that can make them either more susceptible to disease or sometimes have a harder time fighting off disease. One in doses probably isn't gonna have a significant effect, but multiple doses or chronic use, we can also see a decrease in sperm production and sperm viability over time after a lot of steroid use. It's the same thing as stressing out an animal where they have a lot of cortisol, a lot of um, stress hormones circulating in their body. Now we're giving it as an injection and having the same effect. So on vaccinations for a bull, it was mentioned um, doing the same as the cows. Um, this person mentioned that they use virus shield VL5 in their aged cows. However, it does not appear to have the manahymen in it. Can you use something like Zoetis one shot BVD to cover this? Uh, you can, yeah. So um, a lot of those multivalent vaccines will um, stick to the viral components and a few bacterial components like leptospirosis, but many times they don't have other, what we call bacterins, so other bacterial causes of pneumonia like that. Um, same would go for pink eye or um, other things. And so, yes, you can use another one. Now, I'll tell you that in a perfect world, we would spread out vaccination every couple of weeks to get another one so their immune system is constantly reacting. That's obviously not practical for us to do. So if we expose the bulls to too many different things at once, we can, um, in rare cases, have reactions to that. But sometimes we worry about having a really good response to those products. And so if possible, so spreading it out, but I know that's really not going to happen. And so um, using another co product in combination is fine. We recommend if you're using multiple injections at the same time, though, spreading them out across both sides of the neck and the animal so that it's not all happening in one little area in that muscle. So another uh, vaccination question that just came in, it, that was 50% of the bulls are getting shipping fever when they go to the bull test. They vaccinate for everything possible and use multi-men. What are they doing wrong? Well, it's going to be a fact. I don't know if you're necessarily doing anything wrong. Um, certainly, you know, the viral components we talked about, if they're getting the Mannheimia, um, Pastorella, and Histophilus components in another vaccine, that's going to be setting them up for their response. But like I said, you know, vaccines are not 100% effective. They are very good at um, reducing risk and reducing severity, but transportation is stressful. Climate changes in different environments are stressful. And when you get to a bull test or a feedlot or anything where you're commingling animals from different locations, even if they're in their own pens, but they're still exposed, they're going to be stressed. And so that stress is going to be there. So I think by giving them appropriate vaccinations and having that last vaccine be at least three to four weeks before you ship them so they have an appropriate time to respond to that vaccine is going to be great. Now you're giving multi-men, you know, and we talked, you know, some of the injectable formulations can have a very short-lived effect. So there is always the potential for other mineral deficiencies that may not be corrected long-term with an injectable product. So, that, you know, other oral supplements may be um, some benefit to help there. But unfortunately, we're not going to prevent ever all disease. Perfect. So switching gears, 
Um, how long after a bull is exposed to possibly trick positive cows would you wait before testing it? Uh, good. Um, well, we like to wait at least 10 days. So, um, and when we test a bull, that's what the state of California requires. And that's to allow these organisms to multiply and increase in numbers if they're there, giving us the best chance to catch them on a test. Uh, continuing on that theme, if you lease a bull for your breeding season, do you recommend testing 30 to 60 days before you want to breed your cows? And do you have the bulls tested or have the ranch you are leasing them from test the bulls? And that's going to come down to the agreement between you and wherever you're um, leasing them from. Most people that I know who rent or lease bulls or provide them have a very good agreement and they do send um, satisfactory breeders out. And if there seems to be a problem, then the, um, the ranch that's doing the leasing will almost always replace them and make, make it right. You know, there are a lot of bull warranties on sale and that sort of thing. The problem there is you may not know until preg check many weeks or months down the line if he wasn't there. So um, I think it's always warranted to do that just because in all honesty, um, there could have been something that happened that the leaser doesn't know about and they're not doing it out of any malicious intent to send you a bad bull. It just may have happened um, without their knowledge. So I think it's helpful either having them do it or even if you did it on your own once the bull's on your place um, before turnout. And just the first part of that, what is the time frame to have them tested before you want to turn them? Oh, up? I mean, we usually we always recommend 30 to 60 days just because that gives you enough time to find another bull if it's not good. But in all honesty, if it's coming from another place to use immediately that you have a contract with, doing it one to two weeks beforehand would be fine because then you know it's closer to the time you're using them. Um, and if he's not passing, then hopefully there are other bulls on site that can be used right away to fill this place. So we're talking a lot about bulls. So we will switch it a little bit to AI. And would you say it was better for small farms um, to use AI versus owning a bull? It depends. <laughs> and it really, and I, 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 everyone hates that answer. And, and I know for good reason, I hate that answer too, but it does. It really depends on your goals, right? Um, and your facilities. So if you, depending on how small the herd is, um, it may not be justifiable to have a bull on site, right? And if you have, uh, and it may be more economically feasible to always synchronize and breed cows with semen that you've purchased. Um, if you have, you know, a good shoot, now I see somebody you can work them multiple times. And so it really is going to depend, but if it is a, it is, if it's a very small operation, then many times I think AI is more economically viable because you're not paying for the maintenance of a bull all year long that you're not going to, uh, um, not going to use all the time there. Perfect. And the last question that we will answer tonight is what is the efficacy of the new internasal bovalis with pasteurella? Can it be used with just one dose? I believe it has a one dose claim to it. Um, so I don't know. I can't give you a number on efficacy. Um, but what I can say is that generally when we give intranasal vaccines, we're stimulating a whole, different, a whole system of the immune system and getting what we call mucosal immunity. So we're trying to enhance local immunity where first contact of that virus or bacteria is going to happen and hopefully give us the best chance there. We also get this non-specific stimulation of your immune system that can help as an overall system. Um, historically, we've had there have been variable efficacies of intranasal bacterial vaccines like the Pasteurella vaccines, and we've often relied on injectable to get that. And so, I'm not sidestepping the question, but I actually don't know the specifics on that one. Um, Thank you to Dr. McNabb for sharing your wealth of knowledge with livestock producers on key strategies to keep your bulls healthy and prevent diseases. Thank you for watching this webinar recording that was brought to you by the University of California Cooperative Extension and University of California Davis Veterinary Medicine and was co-hosted by University of California Cooperative Extension Advisors, Tracy Shore, Grace Wood-Nancy, Rebecca Ozeran, and Specialist Dr. Gabby Meyer.